I was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My grandfather on my father's side was a minister and my grandmother was a homemaker. And I didn't really know a great deal about my mother's relatives. My parents were Jenny Moliere and Glenn William Jenkins. My mother was a homemaker and my father owned the small community grocery store. I can remember um, from my early childhood that um, he had the store to the best of my memory. And at one point, when I was about six or seven years old, he would put a stool behind the cash register. He taught me to count money, and I was his first cashier. But I'm sure today that could not happen because it would be violating the child labor law. My mother was uh, a homemaker, and at one point, in my early life, I'm told that there were five of us. I was the third of three children. I had brothers who uh, died at a very young age. And who, after I was born, my mother um, passed when I was six months old. So at one point, there were five and we ended up being just two in the end. There were like five siblings on my father's side, and it was like they, I belonged to all of them. My Aunt Lottie was an educator, um, well above out front when it came to education and making sure that we had proper nutrition, a good education, in fact, I, when I was about three years old, um, she taught at the Winston-Salem, was at Teachers College at the time, and she was in the field of childcare and home economics. Took me to school with her and learned to read really at a young age, to count, and as I'd come home, I had cousins and I would teach them. They weren't too happy with some of the things I said to them because I thought I knew much more than I did really know. I, I participated in the laboratory school at the teacher's college. Uh, they, at that time, um, students who were in their junior and senior years had uh, courses to prepare them for student teaching in the public schools there. So we were the ones that they worked with in their early training. I loved school and I always have. Even until today, I go out to lifelong learning and, and uh, you know, just pursued education. At the high school, I participated in uh, sports. For example, uh, I was on the basketball team, swimming team, and during the summers, I was trained to be a lifesaver, junior lifesaver at the pool. And I think that that, I still love sports. I attended college in the hometown that I was born and reared in, Winston-Salem Teachers College. It's now Winston-Salem State University. My major was elementary education. At that time, that was really what was offered to us, elementary education. And then you could pursue uh, home economics as another component. But I uh, received my BS degree. The first uh, school I taught uh, in was in Boyd's, Maryland. and. The, the um, headquarters for those schools in the suburbs were um, in Rockville, Maryland. So I went, when I went for the, the interview, the person who interviewed me said, you know, I got the letter saying that I would be ass assigned to Boyd's Elementary School. And I was just so excited at that time they told me what the salary was, 
it did not matter to me. They could have told me $320 a year, but it was like $3,200 a year back at that time. I was so excited. My husband worked uh, in the city. I drove to board with, with a, a number of other young teachers every day. I did not get home until after 9 o'clock. Our principal would have meetings, long, long meetings. And I saw myself being separated too long from my child because when I got home, she was tired and didn't want to, you know, do her homework. My husband was helping with the homework, et cetera. I said, you know what? This is too far for me to drive every day. So I asked them in Montgomery County if they would move me to Rockville. They did not want to. They said, oh, you're just doing so wonderful out there. They love you, you know. And I said, fine. I said, but you know, I really need to move closer to Washington, D.C. And they said that they did not have anything closer. So I applied uh, to Washington school system. And I was hired by the Washington, D.C. school system, placed in the laboratory school where we trained teachers, getting them ready to become teachers with their methods courses, et cetera. At the laboratory school, they then fed into the administrative system. At the same time, I was at uh, George Washington University working on my master's degree. Before I got my master's, an interesting experience. I applied to Catholic University. And when they got my paperwork, having the name, you know, last name, surname, Deleuze, they, they call you in for the interview. So I went in. I think they were expecting another hue, but um, I got a letter from them and it said that um, we were impressed with the interview and da 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 and your credentials, but we are not uh, enrolling uh, colored students at this time. My husband encouraged me. He says, why don't you take administrative courses? It'll make you better in what you're doing, et cetera. So I did. And my list, my name came up on the list after two years in the Washington, uh, D.C. school system. I, they were looking for young, talented, you know, teachers who had diverse backgrounds to work. Uh, because integration was just kicking off at that time. So I was named uh, an assistant principal first at Scott Montgomery in D.C. with a military, uh, I think they go for training every three months or so. And after I was there about, I would say, six months, he said, you know, you, you're doing fine. You can get help but I'm gonna leave you here uh, to be, act as the principal. I said to myself, I don't, I don't really know how to be a principal, but I, I'll try, I'll do my best. He said, you're gonna be fine. And um, I did, I, I worked that uh, six months while he was away. And the following year, they appointed me to a principalship. I was ready for that though. I had gotten my master's and all. Um, and the most interesting thing about that was there were others in this school who had applied and I was awarded the principalship. So I said, oh my. There were about 72 teachers there and I had an assistant principal. When I uh, went in for my first uh, meeting with the, with the staff and all and greeted them. They were more mature, at least I thought they were, than I. But I felt confident and 
that the next morning after our first faculty meeting, I had a follow-up meeting because I got phone calls saying, they said, that little lady doesn't know what she's doing. She just got out of college. So I said, I called them in. I said, well, I, I understand that most of you had an interesting evening. Um, there were telephones ringing all over a place. Now, I'm not sure if I'm giving you the accurate uh, picture, but I understand you said, I didn't know what I was doing. You didn't think I was too young for the position. They had more experience, some of them. I said, but I'm it. I'm what you have. I was appointed the principalship, and this is what you have. I need your help. I cannot be successful without you. I said, but you need to understand, too, there can only be one ship. One, one captain to this ship, and I'm it. And so, as, as a result of that, when I left there, seven years later, and uh, they uh, had a farewell for me, they had this big ship, and they got up to, to say, this little lady, they, they did like a, what was that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and said, pretended they were me, how I came in. And then one lady said, you know what? I was almost ready to retire, but I said, oh yeah, she has this. <laughs> but it was just like a wonderful experience. I'm telling you, it really was. I was a principal in the Washington, D.C. school system. We had the two children by then, a son and a daughter. And we lived in Washington but shortly after that, we moved to Montgomery County. We had built a home there. And across the street from us, um, there was a, t a teacher and her husband. Her husband worked for McDonald's Corporation. At that time, they had not licensed any restaurants to anyone in, that, in our eastern region. They were only would have, uh, and especially persons of African descent, work in the kitchen, peel potatoes, and all of that. So right after the riots, they found that the company was smart enough to know we can't run these neighborhood restaurants because they, fires had been lit in many of the locations, et cetera, et cetera. And the young man who lived across the street said, you know, you, you keep saying you want to own your own restaurant. You're not happy in, he was in the upholstery, uh, canvases for cars. And he said, so why don't we talk to him tonight when he comes in? So a gentleman came in from Chicago and he was invited over to this meeting to talk to them about franchising. My husband came home so excited about this opportunity and how much money and how many lives could be touched for our, our race if they would, could uh, franchise stores to African Americans in their community. And I was half asleep. But when he started to throw around some of those numbers, and I asked him, I said, well, what did they serve over there at that party? <laughs> I just want to know, I could not envision the economics of the possibilities. Recognizing that it, it doesn't always happen that easily, but I said he had always supported, we'd just been a team all the way and um, I said, well, if you really want to do that, then we, we can do that. And he said, are you sure? I said, Sh -sh whatever we decide we want to do, we do it together. And so he said, fine. So we had an opportunity to apply. They accepted us. They accepted the couple across the street. And so we became partners in the McDonald's franchise. We were given the opportunity to go to, to Atlanta, to Philadelphia, 
and one other southern location. However, my parents lived in Philly, so we decided to go to Philly. And we did. I did not go right away. And he said, oh, come on, because I want you to learn the business. And I said, you know what? From what I'm reading and the research, I said, this family has become accustomed to eating. <laughs> I have a job. And you know what? Let me stay until you make some of this money you're talking about. So he said, OK. And I stayed for two years. He commuted. We, had, we got a house in Philly. We had the one in Maryland. And we'd commute back and forth until after the two years and, you know, things were looking. So I went to the superintendent. I said, you know, I think I need to, to go and be and help my husband. And so he says, you know, I can understand. We hate to lose you, but, you know, you and I did. And I moved to Philadelphia. But I went to Temple and I registered to, um, to go into their PhD program. But my cousin, who is an educator, we both were born in North Carolina where if you were educated and you had the desire, you got a job and you worked. And she didn't want me to be at home. She said, you know what? Uh, Lippincott is looking for uh, someone to work in their uh, editorial division, elementary education. You have the background, you know, come on. I said, you know what? My husband says, I'm retired. She said, don't listen to him. You come on. And I did. I went for the interview. They hired me. But I had them understand that I would not be just one as a token. I would really have to make a difference. And they wanted to know what I meant. And that was when I told them. I said, you know, in textbooks, and I heard, I've heard Lord mention this many times, textbooks, we always got the secondhand textbooks, never new ones. And it was Tom and Betty, but nobody that looked like us. And I said, you know, if I can make, really make a difference, I'll take the job. And I did. And they allowed me to go through their elementary books and change some of the language and change the, uh, the illustrations to reflect what was happening then in like 1972. My title was Vice President and Editor-in-Chief of Language Arts. And when I first went in, I went in as a senior editor. And they would send me to New York to meet with other editors, and that was where I met Toni Morrison. She was a favorite. I mean, I read her beloved, I don't know how many books, how many times, I never get tired of it. But um, that was good for me to meet. But there were only like three uh, persons of color when I went to New York. But we, we bonded and I came back and our, uh, who, the person who was vice president was going to leave. And they, they never asked me whether or not I was interested in it. And I thought, you know, I can do this. So I went to say to them, you know, I'd be interested in applying. They were surprised that I would do that. You're doing so well at what you're doing. I said, but that's, I like what I'm doing. I can continue to do it, but I'd like to learn more. And I applied, and I was promoted to vice president and editor-in-chief, traveled all over with their textbook division, did very well, exceeded what many thought uh, publishing paid, because it does pay well, and that was how I got, you know, into publishing. My meetings with Tony uh, Morrison were not a one-on-one. -on -one. It, was, it was in a group, and she was more like our mentor. Um, 
talk to us about uh, the possibilities and the difference we could make in the written word and the you know impression we'd have on children from a very early age through their lifetime, through writing and through uh, being literate. We'd go up to the meetings and then she exposed us to others who worked in colleges and universities. She gave me a lead to teach at the University of Denver Publishing uh, School for about, I, about six or seven years I'd go out. It was only during the summer program where we would work with young college students who wanted to become editors, writers, etc. And I also had the um, experience of contributing to a publishing textbook through her efforts and her support of me. I left uh, Lippincott reluctantly and I labored over whether or not this was what I should do. However, my husband had had two heart attacks at the time. And on the advice of his cardiologist, um, they thought that the franchise was a bit stressful for him because he was the one black that was left in Wilmington, Delaware, and only two in the whole uh, southeastern, southern New Jersey and Delaware area. So he was secretary for different parts of the group. He flew to Chicago often. He tried to run his stores. And he really did not have, we, we really, I don't think, were in a position to hire someone to help him, like as a director of operations or what have you. And I said, for him to be responsible for home and for the business, et cetera, he needed the support, my support. So reluctantly, I resigned from Lippincott. I went to help, came to Delaware to help my husband. He did the operations part of the business. I did the administrative uh, part of it, payroll, and that part of it. But I, it really, my heart really was not into it. My heart was into him and our family, but not into the process. But the third heart attack, and when he had to retire, then the company came to me and said, um, we'd like you to come to Chicago and train so that you would have an opportunity to make a great decision about your family. We know how oriented you are. And it would provide you the opportunity to say, yes, I will keep our, we had three restaurants, keep our three restaurants and get the help I need. Or choose your, what you love to do, which is education. And I said, okay, and I did. And I went and I became an owner operator. When I came back, I went into the stores, I learned the operations and worked still with the administrative part of it. He became the person who was my supervisor. And although he thought he was, but I learned a lot from him took his criticism, and he was just like so blessed that I was able to, along with my daughter, take over those restaurants and, and we just like did wonderful things. When we uh, start to fill out the paperwork and apply for the loan, uh, we had 90% of the money. You had to have 100% because of some of the experiences the banks told us they had had with, they didn't say it, but with persons who had never run businesses before. So I said, okay, 
then we'll just have to find another way to come up with the rest of the money. And we did, we had already mortgaged our home, depleted our savings, they had our children, you know, what else did we have? They needed us to work the store, so they didn't. Anyway, the, they called us one day from Wilmington Trust and said, um, Mr. and Mrs. DeLuz, we'd like to talk to you again. And we, we were, okay, maybe, maybe they, maybe we. So we, we went down and they told us that they were going to grant us the loan based on the information we'd given them. I said, hmm, when would change that? After seven years, we learned that our, some friends we had never met had come to the table because they had been pressuring uh, banks to be more, you know, friendly to our culture, to our, and helping our communities, etc. And those persons were Jim Gilliam Jr., Jim Gilliam Sr., the former mayor, Jim Seals. And the former mayor, Jim Seals, was the catalyst, I understand. I said Judge, uh, Judge Williams, didn't I? No, you didn't say Judge. Judge Williams. They did not tell us that they had signed to guarantee the other 10% for us to get this franchise. And the seventh year after we paid it off, they showed up to take us to dinner one evening. And they told us the story. I said, you know, but, but they were always in and out of the store, but I just thought they were in and out of the store to help us. But that was just like so inspirational and will li live in my heart the rest of my life. It was an opportunity we might not have had if they had not stepped up. And that shows you the kind of persons who live in this world and do the kinds of things God would have us all do if we can. I would always attend the uh, co-op meetings with my husband and because I wanted to learn and wanted to let them know he had support. We were, the, the, at that time, the one African-American couple in the co-op out of the three states. And the first, uh, I do not know who recommended me or put me on the ballot. They said, would you um, serve as an officer? Your husband is working already, would you serve? And I said, oh yes. I said, what would you have me do? They said, you will be running against a, 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 a young man whose name is Tony McCallie, very wealthy entrepreneur. Um, and I said, okay, I, I, I will. And I won that election. I was the first woman that they had ever elected to the regional Boogwood. Following that, one of the other persons who was a national operator recommended me to sit on the Ronald McDonald National Children's Board of Directors. I was the first female of African descent to sit on that board. And since then, I have been the first African American to be, have a, an, um, an award called the Lozelle J. DeLuz Award, given every two years to a woman because I really felt that women, as smart as they could be, but for whatever reason, never could penetrate this system that was out there. And they um, did, award me this, they're given, and that was the most humbling, shocking experience. I had no idea that this was going on. 
10 awards were given in my name. And this will be the 11th this year. That was given um, by our region to the person who has the most impact on the system in the region for that particular year. The most important one is this ring, 18 carat, that was given uh, to 18 of us from the national level. So five years ago, they recognized the difference that African Americans had made to the company and because of our involvement, they rolled out the red carpet and gave the 18. These are original rings, the only ones they have in the company they gave to us. The former mayor of Wilmington, Dr. James Seals, was a professor at the University of Delaware. I was doing a, a, a lot of community volunteer work. He was aware of it, and he and my husband had become, they knew each other well, and he said, you know, I would like your wife to come and enroll at the university. We need, to, we need more minority students here. She's just what we need. And from some of what I had heard about the University of Delaware, I was reluctant at first. Um, but Dr. Seals did not give up. One day I told him, I said, well, I have my cars in the shop. And went, he says, oh, no problem. I'll come get you. <laughs> and he did. He was a supporter. He left the university before I completed my PhD. And one, one interesting thing that I might add, and this is just ad lib, but there was a professor on my team when I was working on my dissertation who said to me, I didn't write the way that they wrote at MIT. I said, well, I'm writing from my experience. I can document it from the literature. Uh, and you have an opportunity to work with me, but you can't change who I am. I have to be who I am and come from that perspective. So anyway, we just like, we didn't see eye to eye. And I had to make the decision, am I going to leave this university or let someone push me out of receiving what I, I've worked hard for and deserve? Or am I going to stand up for what I believe is right? So I went to the head of the department and told them, and I said, this is just not working. And I said, so would like to have a replacement for him on my committee. And he said, well, you know, we don't usually do that. I said, but this is not an unusual situation. I said, so if that can happen, then, you know, I will continue. If it doesn't, then I'll need to take the next step at the university. And Dr. Drabant, Drabant was there then. And fortunately, I didn't have to go to Dr. Drabant because they were able to take care of it. But just that's just some of the resistance that you get along the way. And when I talk about all the good things, I almost have to say that life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Being a first in a number of ways, you know, you're always gonna get pushback. But you know what? I've learned to push back. I've had a blessed life. To, from a family of five, to be the one person still from the bloodline, still able to share my experiences, remain positive, have the support and cooperation from friends, and to be motivated and encouraged by an historian like you. Dr. Nutter.
is, is just wonderful. I am a very faith-based person, confident, love my family, love education, love passing it on, and I've done that through a summit that I've done for eight years at the University of Delaware. Only a higher being, I feel, could, you know, be responsible for something like that. And I, I know the things that I can do, those that I can't, so I don't waste time chasing something that's gonna use up too much of my energy. There are peaks and valleys, and I learned that early on. My grandmother told to tell me, you know, every day is not going to be a beautiful day, you know? So you prepare for the days that aren't, just like you prepare for those that are so you know how to handle it. So that's my life.